founder and managing director of Metamorphosis Beats. I'm doing business and digital transformation for small medium enterprise across Asia Pacific, subcontinent, and now EMEA. I am super delighted to motivate an amazing conversation with uh, Kuran, uh, Kuran Zafar. Kuran is a venture capitalist, is the director of 47 Ventures, an executive leader, innovation and entrepreneurship evangelist. And one part that I like uh, is a magician. So I will hear how he may <laughs> multiply his money, who never knows. And uh, the other panelist, uh, I, I could, I'm lovely to see you again. Thanks uh, for having Faraz, me. Thank you. Faraz Ahmed, uh, CEO of Turbo Labs, social multi uh, multiplayer uh, PVP platform, gave develop, game development studio, powering the global mobile chess community. And I think that definitely is a great interest of mine because I'm a super enthusiast of the Gambit Queen and I <laughs> came back to chess. So now I would love to hear more about that too. Welcome, Faraz. Thanks, thank you. Thanks for the intro. So, um, super exciting conversation, guys. Uh, would you like to start perhaps from Kuram, who has been uh, investing for a while? So, you know, um, I'm, uh, I'm a player of the 80s. So I think uh, I, I, I used the first Commodore, the first Spectrum, and then the first Game Boy at the time for, for mm -hmm. who remember the games. So, I would you like to ask Kurama? Kurama, let's start from uh, uh, the game, the gaming industry. You know, um, in my perspective, perhaps at the beginning it was just uh, moving from the games of the childhood to the game in the internet, in with the, the first type of machinery. So, for you that you've been investing for a while, can you tell us uh, from pure entertainment to business? How did you see the evolution of this, this market, this industry? Well, Giovanna, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, uh, 47 Ventures is a Pakistan-focused venture capital fund, and we invested in um, uh, you know, multiple mobile gaming startups in the country. Um, so, uh, I mean, gaming industry, it, it's something that you cannot ignore. Um, I think human mind has always been uh, aside from knowledge uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I guess uh, some form of actualization has always been a secret of entertainment as well and, uh, and keeping oneself busy. And gaming industry, as you mentioned, has evolved from taking some of the, the games we used to play in the physical world to their sort of digital or, you know, uh, uh, virtual representations of those games to now what we just uh, witnessed in the earlier panel, Metaverses, which is a completely uh, different new immersive worlds and uh, I think the uh, the opportunities for creating games and modes of entertainment in that metaverses uh, are going to be completely different from what you know we are used to uh, with our engagement with the mobile phones or uh, computers or desktops at our homes so it's an industry that you cannot ignore it's something that we've been cognizant of and uh, we've always you know very actively sought out opportunities where we um, thought uh, they're good founders, good committed founders who understand the industry and can uh, build products that can, you know, very rapidly uh, scale and grow, which is one of the advantages uh, of the gaming industry. Any other business uh, in the world, um, distribution is one of the biggest challenges in any new product or service that you, uh, that, that you innovate on, right? Um, you have to build out, elaborate teams to, you know, sell and market and then distribute and uh, service those products. But uh, in the case of gaming, that at least that one, you know, aspect of um, uh, launching, conceiving and going a business is taken care of because you have two mega distributors in the world that have, you know, basically democratized um, distribution of gaming content and mobile content uh, for the for any kind of developer, any kind of entrepreneur. So that's uh, one thing that uh, I think any game investor or uh, mobile investor recognizes. Uh, but uh, what's left with is you know hunting down promising, passionate, you know skilled uh, entrepreneurs who understand the industry and can build good products that have 
uh, you know, acceptance in the market. And we have found, you know, uh, one in the form of Faraz and Noor, who are co-founders of Turbo Labs, a great product, Chess Stars. Um, we have an investor in another company called Consoli Ads, which uh, uh, does ad mediation for uh, game and mobile content publishers and, and improves their monetization through advertisements and ad networks. And then we've recently invested in a company that's basically making television interactive and, uh, uh, you know, sort of bringing uh, this uh, interactivity and real world engagement um, to a form of uh, mass communication that has been, you know, primarily broadcast and one way enabled. So pretty excited about this space. Very interesting. Um, as you're touching these parts, for someone like me, I mean, I'm very interested to invest, but I didn't do it yet. And mostly because uh, perhaps I need some elements. So for someone who has money, and is coming from outside, what they are, in your opinion, like three key points that I need to analyze if I want to invest, for example, in a game? Well, Giovanna, uh, those three points are not much different from what you look for when investing in any business for that matter. Um, okay. I think the number one thing that any investor looks for um, before investing in any business is the team that they're investing in. Products change, they, they evolve, the you know, business models pivot, uh, market dynamics change. Uh, what primarily uh, you know, remains consistent throughout is you know, how good the team is that you have invested in. So number one thing that you ought to look for as an investor is the, the strength of the team, not as individuals, but also how they work together. You don't want, you know, uh, mul multiple sort of goalkeepers or wicket keepers in your team, right? You need a batsman, you need a bowler, you need a wicket keeper. So uh, you need to make sure that the team not only is individually strong, but they also are collectively strong and they make up for each other's weaknesses and complement each other's strengths. And they can, more importantly, they can work together. Um, the second thing you generally look for is, you know, as, as venture capitalists, uh, I mean, every investor has its own investment thesis and risk appetite, but uh, venture capital as an asset class is typically a very high risk asset class, which means that they're looking for uh, high rewards also. There's an understanding that some of the investments might fail, but also, you know, when the investments do succeed, they have to succeed in a big way so that it sort of makes up for all the, um, the money that has been written off in failed ventures, right? So the second thing that most investors look for is the ability and opportunity for the business to scale and grow very rapidly and capture a very large market, right? Now, gaming industry, it's sort of, um, is, is, is if you, you know, as a, as a game investor, uh, you sort of know that, you know, this industry is large enough, you know, typically, for example, if you're going into gaming, but there are, you know, uh, different types of games coming up. Um, yesterday, we came across an opportunity that is essentially gamifying the concept of leadership development and training, right, and gamifying that. So now you have to figure out, okay, you know, what's the size of the market that's at the crossroads of the gaming market, as well as the training and leadership development market, right? And that might not be as big as the market. So there's there's a bit of research and analysis and, and just, you know, insights from the market that go into it. Fantastic. And, uh, Thank you so much. Yeah. I think that it's quite interesting what you mentioned, because uh, as you mentioned, it's very similar to the rest of the investment uh, um, kind of uh, background that and due diligence that we need to do. Mm. Perhaps for someone that like me is so focused into the product and the games and you know we've been hearing quite a lot today about downloads, retention, the publishing company and so on. So there is a lot is going on and so to come in inside as an outsider and coming inside to investing what does it mean? There is a lot of research a lot of data analysis and um, you know for, a for example you know, testing the games, the trends, what is the, you know, you just mentioned, actually I do training. So, so I do understand perfectly what you mean. We always find a different way to do education and trainings. And gamification is working extremely well because people enjoy what they learn. And this is a yeah. really great point. Absolutely, I'm, I'm with you. Sorry, go ahead, so Kuram, last point. Yeah, last point was, you know, something that they've already mentioned, you know, in the case of gaming, last point is the strength of the product and, you know, yeah. what kind of, 
you know, uh, opportunity there is with the, with the product, where, how well it's designed or developed, uh, who is it targeting, whether the, the unit economics of the product and how it's sold and, and it uh, monetizes. Um, uh, is, 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 does that make sense, you know, it, it, or, or not, right? Um, uh, the, the thing that's uh, different with gaming industry compared to, you know, a lot of other sort of real world industries is, for example, if, if you have a team that has done a wonderful job uh, creating a factory of some sort in an industry, right? Um, uh, let's say a, a shoe factory. You can count on that team to build a new, a second shoe factory Assuming there's you know demand in the market and you know they come up with a good product, you can reasonably assume that they can do a wonderful job of creating a second shoe factory and you know grow the business. That's not the case you know, in the mobile industry. It's it's very different because um, you you can you can pick the best developers, game developers in the world, and you ask them to build another game product, you know, for the same world, and they may not succeed. Right? It doesn't happen very often. So uh, I, I think that's where the, one of the, the biggest benefits of investing in the gaming industry is the, the, the sort of the velocity and the volume of insights that you can get from a, a lot of your sales and distribution experiments, right? Uh, which is uh, not as, uh, uh, as fast and, and as insightful in, in many other industries. Uh, so we'll talk about that, you know, later on for us can, you know, talk a lot more Absolutely. about it because we've been after him and, you know, th th that's something that he probably dreams of, right? As analytics from his game and, you know, what change is he, is he making and whether it's lowering the acquisition cost and improving the, the average daily revenue and, and such. He can talk, you know, volumes, of, you know, for Thank hours you so about much. that. Thank you. Thank you, Kuram. So Faraz, now I'm coming to you that you are basically, you know, the, the other side of the, the, the game because uh, uh, Turbo Labs, the, um, you know, create a, a, and is a platform. So on the other side, so as you can hear, definitely having a great team, a lot of developers, strong, uh, you know, um, ROI and a great product. So on your side, um, how was it your journey? I mean, you've been for six years, so I'm sure that, you know, as many startups in the, in the market, you, you know, you're struggling, you're testing, you're doing so many things before, you know, really going live. And, uh, and how was your journey to, you know, to attract funds, to find uh, maybe VCs interested to invest in your product and, uh, and, uh, and how was the journey? I mean, I'm sure there's right. many out there that would you like to hear from you from the other side? Okay. Uh, well, well, first of all, thanks for, um, you know, uh, taking over the panel essentially and, uh, uh, you know, asking all of the wonderful questions. So um, a couple of things, uh, you know, we're more sort of, we're not on the other side. We are really, you know, our mindset has been on, um, you know, Khuram's side essentially. Mm -hmm. Uh, through all of this from the beginning. And that's why perhaps we were able to raise the funds because if we were thinking differently, then, um, you know, then we wouldn't be aligned essentially. So um, the startup has been longer, uh, to be honest. I think it's been 20 years since we've been trying to <laughs> start up games, since I got into games. And, uh, you know, ultimately you, you start maturing uh, your mindset towards more like more towards a traditional industry and traditional e-commerce products. Uh, you know, as core gamers, you know, you sort of initially dive into the industry uh, from a creative angle because, hey, I really like this game or I like to program or I'm artistic. And uh, of course, when you dive in that way, you ignore the you know, market reality, the commercial aspects. Um, after getting beaten up enough over years, you start aligning with the market because now you have to, you know, make, uh, make your passion a financial success as well. So uh, our strategy was, uh, you know, from a practical marketing point of view, a commercial point of view where, uh, you know, the game that we started with, uh, which is chess specifically, uh, we looked at that, we looked at the market size for chess 700 million players play chess regularly. Um, so we wanted, we wanted to reach a real audience. We didn't want to take some abstract risk over there. Uh, 
uh, we also took uh, you know further considerations because when you when you create new games um, and you invest in a new game design, then then you're taking a very large risk because that game design fundamentally has to be tested against real players for it to be you know, to show some sort of traction. But again, chess mitigates that aspect as well because it has uh, defined rules. Um, we combine that with the platform strategy where you know uh, you not only have a game but you have live operations and you have a meta uh, universe of features around core gameplay that help you monetize players keep them engaged within the game and uh, you know get the sort of retention and performance metrics that you want so uh, so we we not only chose a real world app but we also you know chose to move in a platform direction where we could repeat and reuse that same uh, tech platform that we have created for further titles that are uh, similar to chess. And it also helped us think about uh, the meta game independently, you know, um, so that and that helped us uh, focus on uh, building monetization features over time. Uh, we were uh, <clears throat> I, I, so so game development um, is a risky business uh, like uh, Casey said, there's, there's a large chance of failure, and therefore uh, you have to uh, rapidly uh, prototype uh, and uh, and reject ideas or modify your game rapidly before the time runs out. You have to demonstrate the right KPI. So we were we were fortunate, and uh, you know, to get uh, very high engagement, which is rule number one for uh, you know game developments. And this is something investors need to you know, look at uh, from a foundational point of view, hey, is there is there engagement inside the game? So we uh, we delivered really uh, high long term retention, uh, you know, when you compare it to industry benchmarks these days, which was great because what that meant for us is that as we built features on top of that engagement, the players responded. So if you don't have players that are interested in the game fundamentally, then when you try to build monetization features or you try to extract a monetization from that system, you're not going to get that response from the players, but we were able to. So iteratively, uh, you know, we built up the KPI uh, starting with engagement. Then we started, uh, uh, you know, doing monetization release and the needle kept moving. Um, and uh, there, <clears throat> most games have uh, two sorts of monetization needles, uh, which is, uh, games generate revenue through advertisements that are shown within the game, and then they're in-app purchases. So both require a different mindset and different, uh, you know, technology stacks and design strategies. So we, uh, so you know, that's what the studio has been working on, and uh, you know, we've constantly shown results, which has uh, resulted in, uh, you know, global interest from you know different publishers and uh, you know, hundred thousand monthly active players that play the game right now. Uh, and this is all organic, uh, so uh, so so the and 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 the platform keeps growing. Uh, the player adoption keeps organically growing uh, for us because uh, because of the earlier decisions that we made. That hey, you know, chess is a big global market, so it's going to have organic tra traction, and we're seeing those uh, we're, we're seeing those assumptions play out for us now. So uh, that's where we are. And, uh, you know, where we want to be is we're looking at the 700 million players and uh, just uh, working on the acquisition aspect of it, which is an entirely different challenge. And this is something that's really important for, um, uh, you know, for uh, anybody getting, uh, trying to develop a new game or invest in a new game. Uh, is you, you can talk a lot, a lot about game design and the platform strategies and all that just just as I did right now. But uh, but if you didn't if you notice, I didn't say that much about the acquisition strategies for those players. Sure. Uh, so so the only problem that we solved uh, related to acquisition was that we said, hey, those players exist. So acquisition will be easier uh, when you try to get those players. Uh, now, very interesting. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but but then when you execute it, you know, it's 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 immense. It's it's as much effort that goes into uh, an investment that goes into developing your features. The other side must be addressed as well. Uh, you know, game simple games 
generate up to 50 different creatives in order to find, you know, hey, which ad works correctly. And then that ad gets applied, you know, uh, to different audiences. So like Facebook in the US, that cohort that you acquire is going to behave differently from your game uh, if you, you know, acquire the same audience in, from the Middle East, for example. So, so, there, so there are multiple channels and there are multiple creatives. There are multipliers upon multipliers when it comes to, uh, you know, user Fantastic. Acquisition. Thank you so, so much, Faraz. So, um, yeah, this is very interesting <laughs> because you're talking about the two, two key uh, points so that is up and almost on every industry. Number one, the acquisitions. So, you know, I'm working a lot in also in consumer goods and now you mentioned e-commerce. So acquisition of new clients, acquisition. So acquisition of players for you. And then engagement, which is a mini, the retention. So <coughs> you can acquire many of them, but then if you don't, they're not keeping playing and they're not keeping be there, or like, for example, I download many games, especially in my mobile app. But then you know how many times? Maybe I use once and then I delete it. So that one is extremely volatile because we are in a market which is going up and down and people attention, spam attention is very short. So now going back to that, I would you like to a um, little bit to twist on into the risk measurement because uh, you know, I, if I, and this one, I'm going to Kuram. Kuram, um, you know, I'm, I like a game. I want to invest in it. I can see that it's really booming, grow, scale up, and so on and so forth. But then uh, is the, uh, the long term, is the persistence, is the retention, is the keeping going, is the different version, how the game evolving, how's the product evolving, that is make, uh, you know, engage always more and more, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, the players and be there. And then some game becoming big championships, right? So everybody wish to have a lot of ROI, but the same, at the same time is a little bit envisioning, right? So what is your risk management? What were you seeing, you know, how, how is the trends, how you see how investing and, and how you manage the risk? One, one game to compare to another one, for example? Hey, that's a great question, um, Giovanna. As I mentioned earlier, um, gaming, getting feedback about the, the traction or success or failure of a game compared to uh, a product like, uh, I don't know, Uber or Kareem or, uh, you know, a physical, physical, real world product, physical world product. Uh, is uh, is a lot more efficient, right? You get, you get immense amount of data, you get it very quickly, you get it in almost real time. So you can use all of that data to make these decisions. Um, the value of a game or value of a gaming business is essentially the sum of the value of the assets, the gaming assets that have been that are being managed by that business, right? And a gaming asset has you know some fundamental metrics. Um, you know, the first one being the customer acquisition cost. How much does it cost to acquire uh, a user for that game? Um, second is, you know, when they are acquired, uh, how do they, you know, remain engaged with the business so that those are called retention metrics. What is the day one retention? What is day seven retention? What is day 30 retention? What is the long tail retention uh, look like? Uh, third is uh, the you know the the users who are playing the game and are retained in the game. What sort of revenue can you generate with them? And those that's typically you know function of either you every user pays to play or there's some sort of virtual economy in the game, virtual goods in the game that they pay for. Or the third one is you monetize that asset and audience through advertisements, through ad networks, and you show ads to that audience. So you sum them all up and you can come up with you know how much. Uh, is the average daily revenue per active user in a game. That's, you know, one of the, the key metrics in that. Uh, and, and then there are, you know, a few more. So fundamentally though, it, it's, it's almost um, uh, scientific to, it's almost a science to ascertain whether, you know, the game at this point in time with the current engagement level acquisition cost and revenue is going to make money or not, whether it's worth the marketing spend to acquire more users, right? Now, as you grow and scale, the, the economics of a game for the first thousand users or 10,000 users are going to be very different 
from this, the economics of the game from, you know, they use it 10,000 to 100,000. And similarly, it, they're going to be very different when you go from 1 million to 10 million users, and then, you know, 200 million users, you know, it gets, uh, people are demanding if they want to stick with the game, they want, you know, evolution in the game, in the stages of the game, in the content of the game, in the gameplay, the physics, the mechanics, the economy and everything. So good games are constantly evolving, right? You know, if, you know, especially games that want to acquire users and retain them within the game and monetize them fully. So there are different types of game. There's some you know, there's a category of game that has evolved called hyper casual games, right? It's basically, you know, games for, you know, if, if you don't want to utilize um, a single neuron in your brain and just, you know, look at your phone and tap, 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 you know, you want to do that. So these are called hyper casual games. Uh, and the economies uh, for hyper casual games are completely different. You know, there's a built in assumption that somebody will download the game and you know play the game for like seven days, ten days, fifteen days, and they'll uninstall it, right? So you 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 sort of have a different monetization strategy for that game. And then there like mid core games or, or games for hardcore gamers, uh, which you know where there's a there's a long tail stickiness with the audience, and uh, you monetize them very differently. You don't show them ads. There's an in-game economy. There's progression levels, the game boards, and you know rewards and things like that. And that's how you monetize them. So uh, the, you know, the, in in the in the game, if you keep a, a watch on the insights and these KPIs, you can continue to sort of monitor the the viability of a game through its life cycle. You can make a decision whether to continue to push it or can it, and then work on your next asset. Right. That's typically what what happens in the gaming industry. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Now, just uh, we're running out of short of time and I have so many questions. By the way, I want to go back to Faraz. Faraz, um, exciting news. I'm following, like I mentioned uh, many times uh, when we talked before, I'm following very closely the gaming industry. So three news on the only two weeks, actually, I think seven days. The first news is that Netflix launches first games on smartphone. So five Android games for subscribers. So hey ho, we have some another big player on the market. The second big news, EA says NFTs are part of the future of the game industries, especially related to sports games, but is open to everybody, which I absolutely agree with that. And last news this morning, and this one is coming directly to you because this what is the key. Peter Jackson's New Zealand is based with Veta Digital sells visual effects to one of the firm I've, I heard before, one of the Unity was just speaking to Unity. So another big uh, hoo-ho for today. So now I'm coming back, especially with the last one to you. So. The gaming evolving extremely fast. Philip present before us about the metaverse. So there is also a lot of investing in the new technology. So if I'm investing in the morning in the gaming, but you guys investing to evolving in, a, in an industry who is speeding up in innovation enormously. So my question to you is how you keeping up and how you are whatever money investing to you or whatever in, in, in your game, for example, you go moving forward and reinvest on developing and moving the, the game, your game further. So are you, are you referring to uh, how are we investing in research, further research and keeping up with the current affairs? Yes, well, absolutely. Um, uh, I think it's, um, it's important to keep focus because uh, the industry is really vast. Uh, when you start thinking about games um, and, and i think Khuram uh, mentioned that that uh, each genre has its own life cycle it has practically its own nature of ua its own nature of development different skill sets different mindsets different product life cycles for example all the way from hyper casual to something like the metaverse that was discussed right now um you know, Unity buying Weta for, I think, $1.6 billion. Uh, uh, that is uh, probably, you know, uh, 
there's a bigger shark now. If you look at uh, the games industry, that's, uh, I believe, around at $180 billion now, uh, projected to reach $300 billion. And it's bigger than Hollywood. So Weta, so Peter Jackson is Hollywood. Now the bigger shark is now eating the smaller shark. So that's exactly what started to happen, which is interesting. Um, and uh, and absolutely, and 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 they're actually um, in the other way around as well. I mean, game engines are being used for uh, movies now. So people they use real time uh, rendering in order to you know speed up their workflows. So. So yeah, um, so uh, so to answer that, I mean, it's such a vast industry, right? So you, you have these AAA games that cost you $200 million plus to create and, you know, teams of, uh, you know, maybe a thousand rotating people that work on a project. And then there are hyper casual games where, you know, possibly one person sitting inside a room on his laptop and, uh, you know, creating that game. So, you know, given the fact that the spectrum is so wide, you have to always be very focused on which uh, as which uh, which genre are you addressing, and you have to be aware of all of the commercial aspects of that specific genre. Uh, so, for us to research into you know other things like metaverses, uh, you know we could be building games for Roblox if we wanted. Uh, we could be doing other things. Uh, I think it's better to stick with a particular genre. But you have to also, and, and, and even within that genre, there's a constant evolution going on. So, so research, uh, I would advise should be focused within, within your focus. So if, I, if you're doing hyper casual games, even those are evolving slightly and you have to stay on top of that. For example, uh, you know, uh, it's really competitive now. So uh, even hyper casual games are taking on a slightly longer format, you know, uh, formats like arcade idol, et cetera, et cetera because uh, you have to stay on top of your own genre. It's so big. So, so watch your own game, watch your own space. Sure, look around, but don't look too far uh, because uh, you, know, you will probably not have enough resources to even look at your own space, given how complex uh, the task at hand is. Absolutely, thank you so much.